Today I'm out in the forest dodging the raindrops to take a look at the 2023 Audi Q4 e-tron. The best way to think of the Q4 is that this is what would happen if a German luxury crossover just so happened to be electric. It doesn't look like a spaceship. It's not blazing fast in terms of zero to 60 times like you do find out of a Tesla Model Y performance. Instead, this is more focused on regular pragmatic luxury car values like a big comfortable interior, a square cargo area in the back, and an affordable price tag. This is thousands of dollars less than a Tesla Model Y. The first thing we should do is talk about the design. Audi has certainly been known for restrained and elegant styling, and that continues with the Q4. This looks like an Audi, and it looks like a modern Audi, just not a modern Audi ahead of its time, I guess you could say. We have full LED headlights. These are very attractive units with a really slim LED turn signal there, but the front grille looks like the rest of the Audi family, and if you weren't paying too much attention, you could confuse this perhaps with a Q3 or a Q5, maybe if you weren't familiar with what the modern units looked like. Down below is where we find the only cooling in the vehicle right there. These are not functional air vents on the side, but we do find integrated parking sensors in some of those areas. The Q4 doesn't have separate fog lights, but it does have what Audi calls all-weather lights. Those are integrated into the same modules as the high beam and the low beam. At 180.7 inches long, the Q4 quite logically slots right between the Q3 and the Q5 in Audi's lineup, almost exactly between as a matter of fact. And the design is really right in keeping with the Q3 and the Q5 as well. That's not what we see, for instance, in the Genesis GV60, where it really looks like nothing else in the Genesis lineup. This also doesn't really look like the Tesla Model Y, which really kind of looks like an overinflated Tesla Model 3. This also slots right between that Model Y and the Volvo XC40 on the shorter end of things, because this is really a tweener. Not only does that put this in a different category than most of the things that you might want to cross shop against the Q4, this is also a dedicated battery electric platform, which is different than we find in the XC40 or the EQB or a number of the other options out there, but kind of similar to the upcoming iX1 and the Genesis GV60, which are not shaped like this and not really sized like this either. That does make comparisons a bit tricky. One thing I hadn't expected with the Q4 is the staggered tire setup. We have 235 with tires up front, 255 tires in the rear on all models, including the rear wheel drive version. So the rear wheel drive longer range model wasn't as focused on range as some of the competition because it still has those meaty tires in the rear. And then of course the all wheel drive model is staggered because the front electric motor is not as powerful as the one in the back. The family similarity continues out back where we do find a slightly more raked hatch than we find in the Q5, but generally upright proportions and a generally accommodating cargo area in the back that we'll talk about a little bit later, but I just want to give you an idea of what that opening looks like. That's one of the reasons you might want to choose this over some of the swoopier options. This does not have a front trunk, but it does have a bigger cargo area in the back versus a lot of the models that do. When you take a look at the Tesla Model Y, for instance, it does have a decent amount of cargo area in the rear and it has that front trunk, but it gets the front trunk because it's seven inches longer than this. And that's really where that space comes from. As you'd expect out of a modern Audi, we get really attractive LED taillights in the back with progressive turn signals, but unfortunately, those turn signals are not amber in the United States. This is ready to tow and there is an optional tow hitch if you're so interested. If there's no front trunk in the Q4, what is under the hood? That's an excellent question. Well, the front section is mainly reserved for pedestrian crashworthiness, something that's very, very important in Europe and not always thought about directly in the United States. Then obviously a large portion is reserved for crash structures. And then we have the HVAC system and of course the front electric motor because this one is the all wheel drive version. Now, I still think that they probably could have given us a small storage area under here for perhaps the EVSE or a charge adapter cable because there is a lot of empty space going on up here. But as I've said in previous videos, European car companies tend to be a lot more focused on pedestrian impact and the question of what's gonna happen under here if you have a non-deformable object in your front trunk. And that seems to be why not too many European car companies are really going after a big front trunk in their electric cars. Now, powering the Q4 is your choice of a rear wheel drive or an all wheel drive model, but both are you gonna use the same 82 kilowatt hour battery pack. Of that 82, 76.6 is usable. If you choose the 201 horsepower rear wheel drive model, then you'll get 265 miles of range. This 295 horsepower model drops that down to 236 miles. DC fast charging and AC charging are identical between the two models. There's an onboard 11 and a half kilowatt charger, and you can optionally charge at a CCS station up to a peak of 150 kilowatts. That will get this from 10% to 80% in about 33 minutes. 
Charging happens in the rear of the Q4. That's where we find the J1772 connector and the CCS DC fast charge port. Every Q4 is going to come with 250 kilowatt hours of free Electrify America charging. That's really only about three charging sessions. And that's one reason you might want to choose the Volkswagen ID4 over this is because it gets a lot more DC fast charging for free. I'm a bit surprised that Audi didn't try and push the envelope in the luxury segment with maybe a year or two of free DC fast charging. That really would have made this an interesting alternative to the Volvo or the Genesis, etc. because nobody in this segment is really offering that benefit. You do have to go down to the mainstream segment in order to get that kind of free DC fast charging. Over a week of mixed driving, I found the front seats to be very comfortable, especially since we have a four-way adjustable lumbar support for the driver and the front passenger. This is a multi-way driver seat, but it never goes as low as some EVs. The seating position is always a bit more upright and a bit more traditional Audi crossover. We have a manual tilt telescopic steering column with a large range of motion and two position seat memory on the driver's door. Jumping into the back seat, we find 78.4 inches of combined legroom and pretty decent headroom back here as well, 38.3 inches. The ceiling is not a complete glass roof, and I'll show you in a bit, but that does make the ceiling shaped a little bit funnier than some EVs out there, but again, a bit more traditional. What's not as traditional, of course, is the completely flat floor because this is based on a dedicated EV platform. That means that it is going to be more comfortable for an adult to sit right here in the middle. Although this is not as wide as the Audi Q5, so I think the Q5's rear seats do come across as a little bit more spacious. Scooting all the way over to the right side of the vehicle, I have this front seat adjusted for a six foot five passenger that I had in the vehicle. There's definitely enough room, although it is in a slightly more upright position than the driver's seat. This is the kind of vehicle where it might be a little bit tricky to put a rear-facing child seat back here. If you want to do that, you might want to wait for the Q5 e-tron, or you're just going to have to move your seat a little bit closer to the dashboard. Speaking of child seats, we have latch anchors for the outboard seating positions, and the little covers are sort of roller covers, I guess. You can actually see you can push them up out of the way. They don't flip up, which means they don't really get caught on your fingers. That makes it a lot easier to install and uninstall a child seat, but if you want to recover it, it is kind of hidden up there. You kind of have to reach up there and then pull it down with your finger and then try and close that off. Of course, we have top tether anchors for all three positions. It's a little bit difficult to see on camera what I was talking about with the ceiling. It is dished right there just above the rear passenger's heads and then comes down maybe about an inch or so in this area right around that light module because of that regular sunroof there. It does open, so it's not a complete sheet of glass. And as you can see, it doesn't go quite as close to the outside of the vehicle as some dedicated platform EVs, and that's because they wanted it to open. Behind the power hatch, we find 24.8 cubic feet of cargo space. That's almost exactly the same as the EQB and the Audi Q3, but definitely above the XC40. This cargo area is certainly a bit squarer than average, and you could put 22-inch roller bags in this upright position if you remove this hard tonneau cover. I am a fan of roller shades because they are a bit more practical. With this one, you're going to have to remove it from the vehicle, got to unsnap it there, and then you'd have to store it somewhere if you want to utilize all of this room for those larger bags. Going in for a closer look, we have a two level load floor and you can put that hard cargo cover right there under the load floor if you remove these side dividers because of course this section is a little bit wider. So let's take a look at what's going on under here. I do think that uh, it would have been nice if these had actually stayed into position, but with them removed and the cargo load floor on its lowest setting, you can see why they did this with the removable dividers, because with them out of the way, you can now put some of those longer items like perhaps golf clubs, etc., in there. But then you have the question of where exactly to store those things. Over here, we have the included EVSE. It is a dual voltage variety, so it comes with a 240 or 120 volt end. It's also a fairly fast EV, which is unusual. It's rated for 9.6 kilowatts max. The onboard charger of this vehicle is 11 and a half, but this is a lot faster than most of the included dual voltage EVSEs that you'll find in a brand new vehicle. So for a lot of folks, you won't really need to buy a separate one. You can probably just get away with using the one that comes with your Q4 e-tron right from the factory. Going even further down the rabbit hole, there is another little storage compartment there. This is where we find the subwoofer for the audio system. Down here, there is a place where you could store your EVSE. This is also where you're gonna find the can of fix the flat and the tire inflator. And I suppose there is just barely enough room in there if everything was coiled up neatly to store those little dividers as well. As we see in many European vehicles, the rear seats are a 40-20-40 folding variety that really improves cargo practicality. 
Now let's take a spin around the interior. Keep in mind that this particular model is almost fully loaded, so there are going to be some things in here you don't find in the base model. Up here we have controls for the power sunroof and power shade, very similar to other Audis. You can see the size of that dual pane moonroof. It doesn't go quite over to the rear passenger's heads. The driver and front passenger get height adjustable shoulder belts, four-way adjustable headrests, and this interior has the leather upholstery. You can see that it's leather-faced, and then we have a strip of Alcantara-like fabric. I don't know if that's actually Alcantara brand or not. We then have heated seats, not ventilated seats up front. And as you can see, the bolstering is not terribly aggressive on the front seat back or seat bottom cushions, so larger folks shouldn't have a problem here. Moving over to the front doors, we have a combination of soft and hard touch plastic. So soft touch inserts right there in the middle of the door, the armrest, and on the upper section of the door, and then hard plastics the rest of the way around to reduce costs and, of course, improve durability at the bottom of the door. For instance, around that bottle holder and storage area down there. Moving up to the dashboard, we find a mix of modern and a mix of existing Audi design. There's a really attractive strip of wood running right across the dash. I think that's a really attractive touch in this interior. The upper section of the dash is made from soft touch injection molded plastics, and then of course you have hard plastics lower on the dash. Audi wanted to give this interior a very linear theme, so we have a strong chrome bar that runs right there through those air vents. We have an ambient lighting strip below, and then a reasonably large bin-style glove compartment. I had absolutely no problem fitting an 11-inch tablet computer inside there. In the middle of the dashboard, we find a horizontal aspect ratio screen. You can see CarPlay is running right now, but this left side of the screen is reserved for system functions, like that home button right there. The rest of the software is very in keeping with the rest of the Audi lineup. I really, really liked this software when it came out a number of years ago, but at this point, I have to say it feels a little bit behind what we find from modern Mercedes vehicles. Moving down from there, we have the controls for the Tri-Zone Automatic Climate Control, Drive Select button there, Traction Stability Control over there, Start Stop button, Shifter right here, it's a different kind of toggle than we've seen before, Pull down there for Drive, Up for Reverse, Park is that button right there, and then we have a button for the Active Safety Systems over here, and the Parking Sensors and Camera button. Then the controller for the infotainment system. This is not my favorite. It's a touch controller with a physical button inside as well. So you can press down on it. It has haptic feedback. You can also rotate your finger around for volume. It does seem to be a little bit easy to confuse if the passenger is sort of playing with the center console. Under there, we have a large storage area. You can easily see I can accommodate my phone there. Two USB ports down there, 12 volt power port, two big cup holders, a very low console right there. So they have the uh, small armrest over here. It does ratchet up if you're looking for something a little bit higher, but not as much covered storage as you might find in some. In here we have a fairly small storage area. Moving over to the driver's side, we have a full color heads up display integrated into the binnacle that also houses this full color LCD instrument cluster. This is one of my favorite LCD clusters on the market because I love the graphics that Audi continues to use. Although it's not quite as adjustable as we find in some modern Mercedes. Now you should know if you really like the Google satellite image view, you will have to pay a subscription fee after the trial period ends. The only other major change to the system versus the average Audi are just some specific EV screens like you find here probably the most important of which would be the EV range screen. You can also get a few different layouts. So for instance, if you want the range and a power gauge right there, you can do that as well. Moving out from there, we have a very modern Audi four-spoke steering wheel, regen paddles on the back of the steering wheel, and the same stocks that we find in other Audi models, including the cruise control down there on a separate stock. These are a combination, again, of physical buttons with touch controllers. So there's one physical button inside there. You can see the whole module moves, and then the system knows what you've pressed based on where your finger is on the touch sensitive front. View button for that multifunction display right there. There's also a contextual button and a back button. Over here on this side, we find some infotainment buttons along with the heated steering wheel button. Out on the road, it's obvious that Audi had a different set of priorities for the Q4 e-tron than a wide variety of EV makers in the US. This is not as firmly sprung and it's not as quick as some of the EV competition. Instead, this is a bit more relaxed, a bit more luxurious. Zero to 60 acceleration in this dual motor model happened in 5.9 seconds. And very much like its platform mate, the ID4, the main reason for that is that they don't ramp power up terribly quickly. So if I just pull from a stop, you can see by the power gauge over there that we don't get full power out of the battery pack until about 40 miles an hour or so. Most of the competition ramps power very rapidly, so you get that sort of neck snapping feeling in the vehicle. Audi decided to tune things towards the more comfortable side of things. If you want neck snapping, you might find that in some upcoming Audi products, unless you can afford the RS. That one is definitely very fast uh, because it's basically a Porsche Taycan with an Audi logo on it. 
but it's gonna be a lot more expensive than this. And this is designed to be more of an affordable luxury crossover, sort of the electric corollary to a Lexus NX or Volvo XC60 or Audi's own Q5. Although I guess you could say that the Q5's corollary is really gonna be the Q5 e-tron because that's coming up very, very soon. In keeping with the more average acceleration profile of the vehicle, stopping distance is fairly average as well, 124 feet from 60 miles an hour in this vehicle. Handling is just as you'd expect out of a modern Audi. It's pretty sharp, it has a nice steering feel, but unlike some Audis, this is a bit better balanced when it comes to the weight balance. It also has a bigger electric motor in the rear than in the front. So this has a definite power bias towards the rear versus something like an Audi Q3. So this is pretty fun as long as you don't mind Again, the lack of neck snapping acceleration that you might find in some of the competition. When it comes to absolute grip numbers in the corner, a number of other EVs do surpass this because they're gonna have wider tires, a bit more of a performance mission, summer tires available, that sort of thing. Audi was really trying to give us a very middle of the road luxury option. And to be honest, I think that's exactly what the luxury segment needs because so many other manufacturers have chased Tesla down the rabbit hole of really firm suspensions. Uh, some have really been focusing on handling because they want that quick zero to 60 time and they want appropriate handling. And not too many luxury car manufacturers are creating EVs like this that are basically electrified versions of existing products. Now, when it comes to snow performance, this should do fairly well. We have a reasonable amount of ground clearance, definitely more than the average EV crossover in the US, but we don't have quite a symmetrical motor layout. In the all-wheel drive versions of this, the front electric motor is a little bit smaller and a little bit less powerful than the rear motor, but it's not quite as imbalanced as, say, a Hyundai Ioniq 5, where there is about twice as much power on the rear as there is on the front, but something like the Volvo XC40 with its approximately 200 horsepower motors on both axles, that does come across as slightly better balanced. Obviously, it's gonna be a little bit more expensive depending on the configuration, but it is gonna get you a little quicker zero to 60, and it's gonna have that balanced power profile. The different nature of the Q4 is really obvious when you get it out on a rougher road like the one that I'm on here versus a lot of EVs in America. Something like a Tesla Model Y, it's definitely tuned towards the firm side of things. Ditto a decent number of Model Y impersonations like the Ford Mustang Mach-E sometimes. But this is definitely softer. So if you're looking for something that has a more comfortable ride, you might wanna take a look at this. And the ride is certainly more compliant in here than in the Volvo XC40. Volvo wasn't exactly copying Tesla's tuning. I think it does ride better than a Model Y, but it is certainly on the firm side. And this is a little bit more on the comfortable side of things. When it comes to ride quality, I'm gonna give this an A- also. Some reviewers that I've talked to this week have been really conflicted about the ride quality in the Q4 because it is a little bit different than the average. This is not firm and bouncy like you find in a modern Tesla or in a Ford Mustang Mach-E or a decent number of other EVs that are really chasing Tesla down that firm and bouncy rabbit hole. Instead, this is more compliant over large imperfections like that enormous pothole that we just went over or speed bumps or gravel roads like we usually test on. But on road surfaces like this, where there's some broken pavement here and there, maybe expansion joints, that sort of thing, you will feel those come into the cabin a bit more than in an Audi Q5. I would say that suspension tune is not too far off the Q3, but it is a little bit different in that the small imperfections come through, but the big ones are very well controlled. The interesting thing about this particular tune is that some folks might find it tiresome out on roughly paved city roads, but if you take this to a national park, it's not really gonna be a problem to drive five or six miles down a rougher gravel road. It's kind of an interesting twist there. When it comes to cabin noise, I measured 72 decibels in here at 50 miles an hour, making this a little bit louder than I had expected. You will find slightly quieter cabins in some of the other competition, especially the luxury car competition, so I'm gonna give this a B minus. You'll also find quieter cabins in some of the gasoline Audis. Now let's talk about efficiency. Over a week of mixed driving, I've been averaging 2.7 miles per kilowatt hour. That's a little bit lower than I had expected, and I'm gonna give this a B plus when it comes to fuel efficiency. However, on my efficiency test loop, I averaged about 3.1 miles per kilowatt hour, so definitely a little bit better there. In colder weather, the Q4 definitely seems to be consuming more energy than some of the competition. During the day, temperatures have reached about 55 or so, and in the morning and at nighttime, temperatures have dropped down to around 35 degrees. These are really the temperatures where a heat pump system is absolutely invaluable for an EV like this to really extend the range. I know a decent number of people have been disappointed by the Q4 e-tron. If that includes you, then let me just propose that maybe you're misunderstanding the purpose of the Q4 e-tron. The mission of this vehicle is to be an electric Audi crossover. It's not to emulate a Tesla Model Y. 
If you want to go zero to 60 in three seconds, you can find an EV that will do that. It's going to cost a lot more than this. If you want one that handles better than this, has different motors than this, has whatever it is that you're looking for, you will probably find that in some of the alternatives. But again, you will pay an awful lot more for it. And the interesting twist with the Q4 e-tron, as well as the Volkswagen ID4, is that these are a lot closer in price to the corollary vehicle that just has a gasoline engine under the hood. So if you take a look at this Q4 versus a Q3 and a Q5 that run just on gas, price-wise, this is right there where it should be. And that's not where we find the Tesla Model Y. The Tesla Model Y is significantly more expensive. So is the Tesla better in many ways? Sure, but it's gonna be a lot more expensive and it's not quite the same thing. If this kind of vehicle does not appeal to you, buy something else. But if you're looking for an affordable luxury EV that has all of the Audi features and gadgets and gizmos that you might want with a price tag that really fits with the rest of the Audi lineup, then you wanna take a look at the Q4. Now it's time to run through the pros and cons of the Q4. The first thing is the elegant design. I really do like it, and I like the fact that the Q4 e-tron looks like the rest of the Audi lineup, something that very few EV manufacturers are doing really outside of the European luxury competition, like Volvo with the XC40 and the upcoming EX90, etc. Thanks to the boxier design, the interior is pretty roomy, but that does impact overall EV range, and it's pretty well priced versus the European competition. On the downside, performance is pretty similar to the ID4, and actually a little bit slower depending on the model you're talking about, because it's heavier and it uses essentially the same batteries and motors. And of course, because of the same battery, the DC fast charge time is, well, just not as fast as a lot of the competition. Then of course, there is Tesla's recent price drop, which takes us on to pricing. The Audi is the least expensive option in the luxury segment at the moment, at $49,800 starting, but you don't get all-wheel drive for that price tag. If you want all-wheel drive, the dual motor setup, that's $55,200. And that means it is actually a little bit more expensive than the Tesla Model Y, which has just seen an absolutely massive price drop. If you have not already seen the details on that price drop, you can head over to Tesla's website. In essence, the long-range Model Y is down to $52,990, and importantly, because the Model Y is built in the United States, it will qualify for the refreshed federal tax credit. Now, if you want the full federal tax credit, you might need to act fast because the federal government has actually put a pause on the battery sourcing and assembly requirements for the moment. We don't know exactly how the Tesla battery pack is going to meet those requirements, but because they've hit the pause button on that at this exact moment as I'm recording it, you now get the full $7,500 tax credit on the Model Y. A little bit later, when those rules actually start getting implemented, that tax credit may either change, it may go down to half, or it may get removed entirely, depending on exactly what the foreign and domestic content of that battery pack and the battery assembly actually is. But because the XC40, the e-tron, and the EQB are not built in the United States, they don't get the tax credit at all. And that means that when you take a look at this pricing chart, uh, even though the pricing range of some of these options in their lower end trims is pretty similar to the Model Y, if your tax situation would allow you to get the full tax credit, it's going to be significantly less expensive. And that really is a big feather in Tesla's cap. Some versions of the Model Y have gotten up to $13,000 less expensive than they were just a few days ago, and that really changes the math when it comes to value. On the other hand, if you're leasing your vehicle or the tax credit just doesn't apply to you, then things are going to be a little bit different because the European models tend to have very aggressive leasing programs available and the price tags are going to actually be a lot closer together. In that window, the Model Y still does pretty well for itself because it's pretty roomy. It has the optional third row. It's a very, very tiny third row and in a lot of situations I actually like the one in the EQB better, but the EQB comes across as pretty darn expensive. I think that the XC40 is actually one of the better options in this segment as far as value. The top end version is not as expensive as the Q4 e-tron. It is a little bit smaller inside in some dimensions, but it's very well equipped. And for 2024, it's getting a pretty significant refresh. It's getting a bigger battery with longer range, the same amount of power, but Volvo has decided to skew the power balance towards the rear with some new electric motors. It's going to get about 250 horsepower in the rear, 
about 150 horsepower up front. So still total about 400 horsepower, but the power balance has changed around a lot. Now, important for a lot of shoppers is going to be range. And this is, again, where the Model Y really excels. And again, why I think that the price reduction in the Model Y is such a huge deal here. When you take a look at this, the shortest range Model Y will still give you longer range than the longest range version of the Audi Q4 e-tron. Of course, with significantly better performance and standard dual electric motors. Now, admittedly, Tesla tends to fall short on their mileage claims. So in a real world, you might get 270, 280 miles of range out of the 303 mile range Model Y, but that is not the base model. That is actually the more expensive version. So you can see that even though that model might get you just 320 miles or 310 miles, depending on how you're babying the battery, it is going to be significantly longer than the average entry in this segment. Actually, nearly 100 miles more than pretty much everybody else with two motors under the hood. And that's why as much as I love the Audi Q4 e-tron, my opinion of it at this moment is actually a little different than it was two weeks ago when I filmed the video in the rain. And that is now that I would probably just get the Model Y if my money were on the line. The Model Y is really easy to live with. The supercharging network is definitely an advantage as far as the smoothness. Locations, CCS is really catching up. And personally, I haven't had issues with the reliability of CCS charging around. I know that a lot of people have, but it's dependent on your area. But again, all of that aside, it's the massive price drop on the Model Y that has really changed my opinion here. Now, keep in mind, you are going to have relatively limited customization of your Model Y. They're just two different versions to get. There are relatively limited exterior colors, just two interior colors. And some of the options are pretty darn expensive. The red paint is a fairly pricey option in the Model Y. It's a $2,000 upgrade. The white interior is an extra $1,000. And if you want the enhanced autopilot feature, which gives you the summon, the auto park, auto lane change, and all that kind of stuff, that's $6,000. If you want the kind of silly full self-driving capability with lots of air quotes here because it is absolutely not full self-driving and Tesla's getting their butt suit off left and right, that's an extra $15,000 on top of the price of your regular Model Y. Uh, that is an additive feature over the enhanced autopilot. So if you get the enhanced autopilot, it's not an extra $15,000 off that one. Basically, uh, you choose between those two options. But it's still a nine grand upgrade over the functionality that I think is relatively worth it on the autopilot front. Anyway, let me know what you think about that down there in the comment section below. And what would you choose if your own money were on the line here? I love the build quality of the Audi, build quality, parts quality, et cetera, I think is above where we see the Tesla Model Y. But the Model Y has the promise of frequent software updates, some of these extra features and functions that you do find only on the Tesla, the reliability of the charging network there. Most people are not charging DC fast charging all the time. However, they are charging at home. So keep that part in mind. But the Tesla comes across as very well equipped and now $13,000 less expensive in some trims. Previously, again, the calculation was simply that the Model Y might be better, but it was also a lot more expensive. Now that is simply not the case. Whether that will change, of course, we don't know because Tesla changes their pricing all the time. Keep in mind that note on the side of your screen that says when we were recording this and when these price tags are valid, because that changes all the time. Let me know. Find me over at Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, etc. And I'll see all of you next week.